You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Holt. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Shoe In Show. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you to those going back to our catalog, 200 episodes, uh, listening to past episodes and trying to skill up and stay informed and hear new ways of doing business from all the different leaders across our industry and experts. Um, this podcast was started almost three years ago or over three years ago now. Um, and it was really focused on, we were, we were going out to, this sounds dated now. We were going out to trade shows and meetings and events. And we're having some amazing conversations with industry leaders. And we just turned each other and we're like, we really need to capture this somehow and share it with other people. And that's kind of how the podcast got started. And, um, you know, during the, this pandemic, we've really kind of escalated, our podcast, and we've been trying to put out a lot more content so that people can get tips and ideas and hear what other leaders have to say. Um, because everybody in the industry has different product, they have different channels, different ways of doing business. But I'm a big believer in ideas. Listening to an idea, thinking about an idea can create the right movement or ideas for your business. Um, and so that is kind of what this episode is all about. Sometimes we just hit pause, right, Matt? That's right. right. Jasmine, we just hit pause and we say, we have all these folks come on. We hear all this really important stuff that they're saying and we need to reflect on it. And I'm a person who thinks out loud a lot of times. And I don't even know sometimes what I'm going to say that oftentimes worries Matt and my, and my wife, but I say it anyway. <laughs> I'm with you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one big thing, this whole episode, it, here's how it's going to go. I'm going to share thoughts in my in my crazy mind, and Jasmine and Matt are either going to walk me off the edge or they're going to pat me on the back. So it's either one or the other. There's nothing in between. So here it goes. Uh, first off, e-commerce. Um, and Matt, we've heard from numerous, numerous members about e-commerce channel, right? So Typically, e-commerce is a place where you can grow your revenue, but not really profit, right? Like we haven't really seen, you know, you can you can get your numbers up, but like with returns and with um, the, the model just isn't that mature compared to like a brick and mortar. You don't get the economy of scale, right? I mean, the That's profit right. is just not there. So I think one of the biggest challenges in this age is if we're going to see e-commerce grow leaps and bounds, I mean... Some people we talked to are talking about half their business in the next several years will be e-commerce. Some are saying up to 25%. Regardless of what that is, we typically see 10 or 15% shoe sales online. So that that growth, let's say it doubles. I have heard, you know, I, I talked to different people and, and one big retailer has trouble even keeping up with the packaging right now um, to package their products to ship it out, Matt and Jasmine. I mean, so... Not even, not even in terms of uh, here. The other, the other side of it is, I see a lot of Penske trucks in my neighborhood run by Amazon because they don't even have enough trucks right now to get the packages out and delivered. So when we talk about e-commerce, it's a great opportunity, but on like last mile delivery or even the packaging from wherever you're doing it, it's just not. We just don't have capacity right now. I don't know what you guys are seeing or think about that in terms of a challenge. It's a huge opportunity, but. It's just not mature in my opinion yet. Yeah, I totally agree, Andy. I'll, therefore, I pat you on the back. I should have a sound. Of, I should have a sound effect. Pat, this is it. Pat or push. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with you, particularly on the fulfillment side, in the sense that you know it. People we're, right now, our weekly sales survey is showing 150 percent up e-commerce. You know, this week versus the same week last year, which is great. I mean, those are great numbers, but. To your point, the cost to fulfill is higher. The margins are much tighter. And so, you know, we just, customers always king. We've said that for a long time, but when it used to be brick and mortar, you know, king was in, you know, how you bowed down to said king was confined in the four walls of your store. Right. Nowadays, you freaking got to jump through all types of hoops and bow down and allow for free shipping and free returns. And they can order five different pair and they can ship back four of them. And then, 
by that point, your cost per customer, your price fulfilled just for that customer is down. And it's you're in the negative to drive that that product out. And that's just not sustainable. And I know it, a couple of years ago, Zappos decided to really kind of increase prices and focus on their core customer that was buying product and keeping product. Right. And I think brands might have to be a little bit more discerning about which which customer they're they're fulfilling those needs for because of the fact that it is, it is more expensive to fulfill the e-commerce order. Yeah. It's almost like when you remove that person in front of you, that there's no guilt, right? There's no, mm-hmm. guilt to return, not, no guilt to buy five and return four. Uh, um, you don't, you don't pause for a minute or think more intuitively about how it impacts somebody and somebody's profitability and ability to hire and create a strong business around that. You just think, I mean, selfishly about what shoes you want and you're going to try on eight different pairs and get it right um, and, and get the right pair and ship the rest back. Um, and that kind of comes to the second part of my thoughts is around like warehousing, right? Mm-hmm. It's a big challenge. And a lot of the members we talk to right now and even internal discussions and even thoughts around the, what, what we were facing before this, the COVID pandemic was how do we rearrange our models for two day shipping to meet this Amazon prime model of right. almost just in time packaging. Right. And that was hard enough. Now you've got instances where um, you may not have your typical retail channels anymore. Some brick and mortar are going to fade just because they didn't have an e-commerce site or it's just not the right product mix or there was an area where it was inevitable. Maybe there's just too much competition. So there's going to, unfortunately, there will be some deaths of retail at brick and mortar, and that will pick up other areas. But people are people have this challenge of, do I centralize my warehouse and create economies of scale by having mass volume? Mm-hmm. Or do I spread it out, right? Do I put one in the West Coast, one in the East Coast? Uh, do I use an FTZ in Canada and drop ship down and not get duty if I have like an athletic with a high duty rate? Like what is my like what's the warehouse model? And I think that's going to shift and change again um, because of last mile delivery issues. So if you have Amazon having problems and having to get like <laughs> Penske trucks or our U-Haul trucks to deliver, uh, and you have postal services having problems and from what I heard, like FedEx and UPS still haven't adopted their models fully yet for, for this jump in e-commerce. You're going to have real problems with, with fulfilling in two days. Um, so, that you know, thoughts around that, I don't know. We don't have solutions yet. I think the solutions will come. Uh, but, Matt, I don't know what you're thinking about that in terms of, you know, warehouse location and efficiencies and all that. Yeah, I think our members are always kind of trying to conf- reconfigure and configure their strategies around warehousing, just talking to them. Even before all this happened, they were, I think, opening up new warehousing and closing down warehousing and just trying to be as close as they could to the, to the customer or to, to your point, the hub, you know, the FedEx or, or UPS hub. Uh, there's a lot of warehousing in Louisville, Kentucky, because there's a FedEx hub there. There's right. a, a lot of stuff in Memphis. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in Southern California because that's where the product comes in. Um, and then we saw with the whole de minimis, and you, you mentioned the the warehouse in Canada, we, we've seen a lot of movement towards as de minimis has been increased on the U.S. side to eight, anything under $800 a day per person, uh, per entry, you can bring in duty free. There was a, a slew of companies trying to get people to drop their product ship it into Mexico, ship it into Canada, break it up, and then drop ship it direct to consumer to avoid duty under 800 bucks. Um, and so that just shows you kind of how the regulatory environment has has impacted uh, warehousing. But when now when it comes to the change in consumer behavior and, and how they're approaching where, they, where and how they get their product, then I think most of our members are trying to figure out the best place to put their warehouses and... Um, and it's often driven by need. And, and I, you know, I just think that if, you know, some companies, they use their stores as many, many DCs, right. uh, some have tried that, but they moved away from it because it's more cost effective in their minds to centralize it. So I just think there's a number of ways that you can, you can skin the cat. And I, I think we're in a time where people are going to be trying just about everything out because nothing seems to be sacred anymore in this environment. Right. And I would say, Go ahead, Jasmine. 
I was going to say, I also think that um, there's room for uh, businesses to try out different models and different ways, because I do think that people are giving them kind of grace, even with Amazon. And like I have Amazon Prime and I understand that I'm not going to get my packages in two days. And I think that's like a general understanding and people are at least like they're still buying and shopping online heavily, but they have some flexibility within them to say, Hey, like it may not get here right when it says it will. So I think there's opportunities for companies to try a couple different things until they get it right. And then things are changing so quickly. So then you think like, is it, is it needed to kind of change everything around? Will we go back to normal soon? Just like, just not being sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the, I think, I think a lot of storefronts will fundamentally change and they might have more, what looks like a service counter where you have more pickups in store, uh, where you have maybe less product out front. I could be completely wrong about this. This might be a pushover. You might have less product out front and it may be like more e-commerce driven. And what the model is when you're buying online is pick up in store. So you reset some of the store. So you have a larger stock room in the back. It may be, um, it may be shipped to your house in five days and that costs a lot less. Uh, for the product, like the product price could drop uh, or, you know, because I know a lot of people don't want to charge shipping and they're just baking it into the cost so that, you know, you can think about that. Mm -hmm. Um, If you want two day shipping, it's going to cost a lot more if you want. And then, you know, people think I'm crazy, but if you want to hire a a pizza delivery guy who's not delivering pizzas between 12 and four to come by the store and pick up five or six orders and deliver it to people's homes, same hour delivery, uh, that would cost more. But I, I think, um, from like a wholesale perspective from like, you know, online kind of Amazon movement there. Um, one thing people haven't been paying enough close attention to is the, the Amazon locker uh, concept. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to be something where we see like in our area, we see an Amazon locker at like a, a grocery store just outside. Right. And right. somebody goes from an Amazon warehouse and they drop all the packages off in one place instead of every single house creates efficiency for last mile delivery and you just drive over and pick it up while you're grabbing your groceries or your Chinese food or whatever it is out of the strip mall. Um, I think because there'll be a lot more retail space open after this, I think there's a, a possibility that either Amazon does it or just a business pops up around kind of a shoe depot where people ship all their stuff to that one place for the area and to lower the cost, the consumer goes and picks it up from that mm-hmm. place, just like dry cleaning, mm-hmm. right? There's a there's a there's a, a desk there. There's nothing else in there except it's all in the back. Um, and you show up and you text them when you're outside. They let you in and they hand you the product, right? You could go a step further and even say there could be sanitized changing rooms where you could try on the shoes, and if it didn't fit, you just turned it right back in there. But it'd be something so barren and so sterile. There's no experience to it, but there's a cost perspective to it where it's like, if you want to do it, if you want to get your shoes this way where we can create efficiencies, we'll lower the cost by $5 a pair. And that could be, I don't know what you guys think. Is that a pat or a push over the edge? (laughs) I'm going to pat you on it and tweak it a little bit in the sense that I totally agree. Like if creating these tiers makes a lot of sense, you know what? It happens in the airline industry all the time. Um, it happens in going to the movie theater as well. If you want premium seating, it happens at a, at a, at a soccer match in Germany, which it looks like they're going to reopen, which is exciting. So to me, it is tiering service and then providing value to that service. So they're not just getting hosed by falling over and committing to anything and everything to get the product to you via via e-commerce. Right. You you tier it and say, if you want deliver, if you want in two hours, it'll be an extra five bucks or whatever the case is. So you're not, you're not crushing your margin um, by by increasing the service. And I kid you not, there's a headline right now where an airline, Frontier Airlines, is offering for $39 extra, you can guarantee the seat next to you is empty on your next flight. <laughs> so, like, if they're doing that, yeah. then you can have an extra bump up. Get it in the next two hours. It'll be $6.99, and you click on it, and off you go. Um, I think that's where you you can enhance the value proposition while not hosing yourself and giving away the storm, you know, giving away the farm as it relates to uh, delivery. Jasmine, what do you think? 
I think that would be great. Personally, when you first mentioned that, I'm thinking how many trips I go on and I don't have everything I need or I would love to have like a pair of sneakers to go to blah, blah, blah. Like I would love to have that service and like set it up. So I I definitely see that being a part of the future of, you know, brands implementing that on their website as an option. Cool. So let, let's go down further down the rabbit hole then, because I think one of the biggest okay. challenges for e-commerce is on on the website when people are looking for shoes, right? So there's a couple of things, and I've been talking to different companies and trying to figure out, you know, I I don't I don't I have an idea of what the future of brick and mortar looks like, and I and I think I'm probably wrong about that, so I'm not going to go there. But if we're focused on e-commerce, I think the future of the websites are going to be forever changed. I think the way we look at shoes now is not how we're going to look at them in the future. And it's not going to be arranged in the same way. Um, it's going to, you know, the, it's just not efficient to search for footwear now on a lot of websites. I think there's a lot of banner ads up and there's mm-hmm. this and click on men's and then you have to keep filtering, filtering, filtering. Um, so here's a couple ideas I have. So uh, I think more and more people will sign up for membership programs because that's where discounts will be applied. Um, and in this environment, people want, low cost options to keep as much capital in their pocket as possible. But as you sign up for these, for these profiles or this, these programs and you're giving your data to, to uh, a company, eventually they'll start to identify your shoe size and no longer do you have to enter your website. Once you log into it, you don't need to see shoe sizes anymore by filter. They'll erase that. Right. Mm -hmm. They may even cultivate by based on some AI, you know, back end stuff, your last 12 purchases and start to suggest things like, you know, you're a heavy runner. It's been three months since you bought a pair of shoes. You probably worn your pair of shoes out. Here's some options. Or you haven't bought a pair of dress shoes in 12 months. Um, You know, here's some options for dress shoes that you may have forgotten right up front, giving good suggestions of products you probably would would uh would want to see up front uh unless you're just going to peruse around but i think i think there's several things in terms of friction for sale in e-commerce that that brands haven't done a good job most brands haven't done a good job of uh of doing there are some brands out there doing a great job but it's typically size so what i mean by that is like how many clicks does it take to get to the buy button Mm -hmm. right these Mm -hmm. filter things all that stuff so I think if you can get rid of shoe size, so like a company like Volumental is doing amazing things to right size people, right? So if you get a scan or eventually you'll be able to scan on your smartphone, your foot as best as possible. Uh, They're still doing physical scans in stores to make sure you get it right. It takes five seconds. And then they have that data and they just add it to the inventory and they got all these scans of the last and the shoes and it matches up perfectly. So not only does it take away that friction to purchase, but it reduces the friction of returns because the the reason why people return is either they don't they didn't understand the shoe visually or it didn't fit. All right. That's mm-hmm. typically the two reasons. So you eliminate the fit. So so I think shoe sizes will be eliminated as more and more get their feet scanned. Um, which also means they can spend less time in a store, uh, a brick and mortar. If they walk in, they can automatically have that data attached to something and the store clerk can help them pull things really quickly, or they can already have something uh, like an appointment set up where it's already pulled for them based on that. So that kind of data in the programs, I think, will become ever more important. And I think your shoe, your shoe data, your grade, the size of your foot, the width, the girth, whatever it's called, um, I think all those different factors will be just as important as your zip code going forward. So I think the more brands can do that and eliminate those filters, the better it will be. And the same way the visualization aspect of the sites will be different because I think you'll be able to search by voice uh, more and more. So as you go on a website, just like you can on Google now, rather than typing it in, I mean, if you look at what happened in China, the Chinese don't type in stuff to search. They push the button on their phone and they ask the phone to find it for them. Right. We, we started the search because we had a AOL and Yahoo and it was kind of ingrained, but even younger generations now are just using voice for search. And I think, websites will start to filter that in. So you get on there and you say, I want an Adidas boost and it'll already know your size and it'll pull up all your options for you. And you say blue or whatever it is, it'll keep filtering instead of by clicking, it'll filter by voice. Um, but the visuals will also change because you'll have 3d models and scans. You can spin all the way around. 
um, and just visually have a different stimulation so that it fixes the other aspect of returns, which is uh, I didn't expect it to look like this, right? Like it didn't, you said gray and it came in like dark gray and I didn't like that. Um, right. so I don't know what you guys are thinking like around that. Um, just those two concepts around fit and size and visuals. So first things first, Andy, when you do a voice search and you say Adidas boost, what you'll get back is again with the boosts. What's <laughs> with the boosts? <laughs> but beyond that, all kidding aside, you know, we we're hearing so much about uh, CRM investments, right? Customer relationship management systems. Um, we talked to Cliff Sifford about their CRM system. We see this constantly about one of the key aspects of developing a robust ecosystem of your consumers. DSW does a great job with this. You know, these are rewards programs. These are email and text programs. These are frequent shopper programs and point systems and the like, if you want to kind of conceptualize them. And so you couple that with the increase in direct to consumer, the DTC stuff. And I just think, I think you, because of robust systems like that, you will be, these companies are already collecting a lot of this data. So the question comes down to, if you want to, if you want to do what Andy, what you've laid out, then you really got to kind of leverage those CRM systems to, create those opportunities to engage with their consumers with that data. Cause you're capturing, you know, you know, you know, Andy's bought 15 pairs of Adidas boost size 12 <laughs> over the last you know two years. So, I mean, I get, I think that we're getting to a point we're all data. So inundated with data, we're all trying to access data. Businesses are no different. They, they live and breathe by data. And I think this will just be a, the next extension of that. So it makes a lot of sense to me. And you take that with digi digitization and visualization tools. Um, and I think you'll, you know, the ecosystem will exist for consumers to uh, engage and interact with their retail, you know, with their friend, with their retail brands and, and products that they like. And I think the retailers in, in return will have the data available to, to make those things, to track sizes, to track, to track seasonality. If, if you figure out, for example, a family is buying three pairs of sandals in March, white sandals, guess what? Now you have a, a metric on you have an Easter shopper or if, if it's a family buying three pairs of shoes in August, you know it's a back to school shopper and you know based on their ages that – on average, this is the next size you should suggest for those for those kids who are growing the year after that. So I think you can really start to segment. I mean, in politics, we learned, you know, Karl Rove kind of revolutionized this micro targeting politically, and it, it helped the Bush administration, President Bush, be elected. But there's so much micro targeting that goes on politically now. The same can be said for the consumer. You can micro target the heck out of this because we have access to all this data. And I think the stronger CRM systems that, that companies have in place, the better they can leverage that data. Yeah, I, w I would add to it too. You got to, I would say you have to put a, a personalized face on it as well. So I remember going to, in DC, it was Olson Records for many years I went to before it shut down, but it was like this like local record shop. And I think they did it at Sam Goody. They also had uh, at Blockbuster, they used to do this. And at Total Wine, they do this, but it's, it's uh, employee picks. Mm -hmm. Right. Like what's, mm -hmm. what's something that this employee really likes style wise or fit or feel based on, you know, I'm a runner, I do this, or I'm a hiker, I do this. And so you can attach an employee at your company in your store or in your operations or in your warehouse or wherever, highlight your workers at the same time you're connecting with someone saying here's shared interest and you're personalizing the, the technology. I think sometimes the technology is a little scary because something pops up and you're like, well, how did you know I was looking for sandals that were white because I did last year? Like that's a little mm -hmm. scary to me, right? That's why some people don't have voice technology in their house. They think somebody's eavesdropping. They are. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but if you can personalize it and you can tie people back in and form those relationships where they don't feel like you're selling them, but you're helping them. I think that's very important. I think um, the other friction points for e-commerce still, and they're, th this is rapidly evaporating, but like financing now, um, I'm amazed at how many brands, uh, big and small now, are, are working with financing companies to say, you can spread your payments out over three months, maybe even six months, depending on how much it is. 
um, in order to ensure that they make that purchase. Um, so I think that's the other thing is the friction around around financing. And then also the last point in, that I think of in terms of friction, and it ties back to that delivery system, like what's your tier? What are you willing to pay for? How fast do you need this? What's the ease of getting these things, right? Is also at the upfront, what's the right pricing? We have such a hard time with with discounting um, and searching for the right price. Um, and I think if people would just get it right at the front end, it'd be hugely impactful. But obviously, we work with First Insight. They're one of our partners, and they support us. And mm-hmm. they're doing an amazing job with helping brands take a look at you know, upcoming seasons, upcoming samples, and testing it for them in the marketplace and saying, do you like these colors, styles, et cetera? Okay, what's the right price point that you would be willing to pay? Because it eliminates that discounting online where you're just liquidating and if you're liquidating and you don't have large margins anyway, you're losing money with that stock at that point. I mean, it's a huge, it's a pileup issue down the road if you're not doing it up front. So I think the other aspect is the financing and the price. So it's like when you're about to buy it, you know, it. do you feel like it's valuable? You know, mm-hmm. so that comes down to the marketing side. Yeah. And I think a lot of people do really good with marketing in our industry, but is it the right price and can I finance it? Yeah. yeah. I think that was a good idea, Andy, what you said about what Total Wines um, does about, you know, having employee picks. I actually move in that direction when I'm in the store, too, especially when I'm in the mood to just try something new. It's very helpful to find the associate and have their little picture on there or you can at least, you know, match it with their name tag. So um, I think that that is a really good idea. And I'm actually surprised that it hasn't been done because of how like your your experience is already in a shoe store that makes um a lot of sense and usually people who work at shoe stores are people who really enjoy you know shoes not necessarily just anyone like um that you may find like at a grocery store maybe or something like that so i think that was a great idea and i would not be surprised to see that in the very near future yeah um, all right, you got, we, we've yet to push you or kick you in the back. So you gotta, you gotta, you're going maybe I'm in the right direction. <laughs> I'll stay away from fashion then because then I won't be pushed over there. Um, I, I think kind of the last bit or piece of e commerce. So, I, I, some of those are very easy, right? You can fold some of those in to your existing operations, it doesn't require a complete site redo. I don't know how many people I talk to in the industry and they're like, wow, that would require a whole different system. And I, in my mind, I'm just like, if you're, if your platforms aren't that agile to make plugins for new dynamic experiences or opportunities to engage the consumer, then why are you using that platform? I think as we go forward and people start to look at technology, they really need to be very harsh with the people they're working with and ask simple questions like how is your platform going to mature as the consumer changes? Like, cause I think there's a lot of stuff out there that's cookie cutter that goes cross cutting industries and that's fine. It works, but I don't think we're asking enough tough questions, not just can I sell for my warehouse and will it get there in two days? But do I have these options? Do I have the ability to plug in extensions? Do I have the ability to do all these things and will it still be secure? And if they're, if these platforms are agile or if you go to them today and you say, Hey, like what's, what's the new upgrade you're doing to make sure that we can capitalize on these opportunities. If no one's thought about that at those places, you should probably start looking for different, different um, platforms to sell on e-commerce. I mean, I know there's Salesforce and all these things and they're constantly upgrading, but some people aren't using the best in class um, software and I know it comes down to a cost, but um, but I do believe if, if they're not agile enough for you, then you need to explore it. Just like if the warehousing isn't working for you in one location and you got to start splitting it, you have to run all these scenarios in the same way. We can't we can't be so stuck to one one solution software provider for e-commerce just because that's the one we've been using for 10 years. So what um, if it's not working? It's not working. Um, and one one huge plug in I see this coming in the future and everybody, you know, I've been talking about digital stuff for a long time and some people roll their eyes cause I talk about it too much. Um, but one big thing that I see coming on brands websites in particular is the opportunity to customize and personalize your own product. So never before, like I know that people have been talking about this for years, but now there's a company that just joined FDRA. It's called, um, and I'll butcher the name, but it's called XPV. It's E X P I V I. And they've been working with several of our, you know, member companies 
to figure out how they create dynamic experiences online where you can go look at a shoe you can instantly change the colorway. You could possibly move materials around. You could change the eyelids. You could do change the laces in real time. Um, and it's based on their back end um, technology that you create these conditions um, or constraints. And it's like, you know, you could only change the shoe up to five times, or it's almost like a salad order, right? You go online, I see a salad. I don't really like blue cheese, to be honest. I like feta. So I want to substitute feta for this. Like if I can make an order online at chopped salad or, or sweet green and change what I want to make it better for who I am, then obviously we can do it for shoes. It can't be that hard within constraints. Like obviously you're not going to change the shoe design or shape or construction for obvious reasons, but you could certainly change out colors. You could change out like the logo. So if a Nike has a swoosh, I'd rather have an orange swoosh than a red swoosh on this shoe. Mm-hmm. Like how much more does it cost to do that in a factory that already has the the product sitting there? And I would say a lot of people say, okay, customization, personalization, how many people want it? Yeah, you're right. It's limited, but it creates something really dynamic on your site where even if you didn't go down the rabbit hole in the customization, at least you could change the colors and it allows you to spin the shoe around in a 3D model and zoom in and zoom out. It gives you these great dynamic visuals and the ability for a consumer to play with it means they're on your website longer, right? So you get more ingrained, more branding, et cetera. But I think, um, I think what will make it happen in terms of making it uh, profitable is that there's going to be a lot of factories that go under in China, unfortunately, because of this. There's going to be a lot of capacity. There's going to be new business models at the production level where you see these sample factories turn into legitimate production facilities for small-run product. So there could be opportunity for a lot of new brands, or it could be existing brands have an opportunity to create personalized experiences online, choose what color you want, where you want it, if you want to move something around here or there. Um, and in the same way that this software allows you to create augmented reality where you could try it on your feet, um, from the website. Yeah. So it, you know, if you have these 3d assets, the visuals change from taking a picture and throwing it up there to all of a sudden letting the user spend 12 minutes on your site, messing with it. You get all the data on the back end as to why John wanted a, an orange swoosh versus a red swoosh or how long you looked at it. And then you can follow up through your CRM stuff, right? So all of a sudden you're you're integrating the experience, the the CRM, all those things to say, what is the customer doing on our site? Why are they doing it? What do they want? Mm-hmm. Um, and can feed back into your trends. Well, let me ask you this, because I've I guess I've done probably six or seven customized shoes before. I think all of them have been Nike. If I'm not, no, I've done I've done a Vans product as well, um, and then I've messed around. You and I have messed around with the Under Armour stuff when they came out with yeah. theirs. Um, kind of, are you looking at from this viewpoint to more democratize that kind of activity, or do do di- do things differently than what the brands are already doing, at least in the athletic space for customization? No, I think I'm I, I, democratized in terms of anybody can do this. Right. right. So I think in the past it's been Nike and Adidas have done it because they either had to build it or they were working with some high tech firm and they had the money to invest. But now what I'm saying is like there's companies out there that are are able to integrate this into your platform on e-commerce that don't cost a lot of money that can create a real dynamic experience. And you know, the challenge is some people just will ignore it because they're like, well, do customers really want to personalize? Well, what if what if 10% of your customers did and those 10% you haven't been capturing or keeping on your site and aren't converting them to buy? Yeah. So, you know, and then all of a sudden you are. So, you know, the, the question needs to be flipped. It's not like, well, this isn't, do people really want this? It's like, you know, do you, do you actually know if they want it or not? Do you actually know on your platform if somebody's on there, do they... You say they don't want to customize, but how do you know that? You know, right. and how how else to know except to throw it up there and test it and see what it is? And I I asked uh, the guy I talked to at the company, the Six PV. Uh, he worked at Crocs and Deckers and all and all and I think Columbia and all over the place. And he's mm-hmm. just like he's like as soon as somebody throws it up there, we keep like ninety five percent retention because people all of a sudden start to really have fun with it and they see what it does with the consumer. Right. And it's just something new and cool and 
forward forward thinking so um yeah i love it the i i totally agree with him the times i've gone in fact i did it this week i'm trying not to spend money right now but um i did i went in and created a pair of shoes on nike's website with one of their old iconic uh, shoes and uh i was so close to buying it because i'm like man that, that's a good looking shoe but um you're right. It totally amps up the engagement. And even on the vans I created to have to be able to use your own personal photos or art or I mean, that's that's just super cool. So you got you instantly have a unique pair of shoes, a one of a kind pair of shoes that are out there. And I can tell you when I wear those shoes, my Jesus vans, warm in, warm in Israel, um, I get so many questions about them and con- and people obviously want to know the story behind them, but they also are like, where did you do that? How do I get access? Where can I go and do that with my right. own take on something? Right. And I, I just think, you know, the thing is, is you don't have to figure this stuff out on your own either. All mm-hmm. these things that we're talking about, there are already companies doing this. They already have case studies from brands they've been doing it with. The only challenge is, are you willing to try something different? That's mm-hmm. it. Are you going to do I I have a firm conviction that digital can be just as good as physical. Like I want I want physical to succeed and I want there to be jobs. I know there're going to be different types of jobs that are going to be out brick and mortar. I want them to succeed. I'm not trying to eliminate that. I'm just saying in the digital space people haven't been thinking about digital the way digital is. Like they think about digital from a physical mindset and that's why a lot of people have been missing the boat with these opportunities in the digital space to kill it. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, uh, we, we had Mike McCauley on who operates the fleet feet in Augusta, Georgia. And one of his comments on one of the previous podcasts was every time a person walks through the door, I got to convert that into a sale to be mm-hmm. successful, right? To make my margins, to make my profit, to grow my business every single time. But it's amazing how people look at digital and don't think the same way. Every time a person hits your website, you've got to convert them in some way. Mm-hmm. And there's just no, I don't see the real urgency or tools being used to do that. And it concerns me a little bit. And I think that'll change. Like, obviously, as Jasmine said, there's an opportunity to test and fail and try things. Um, but there's got to be a willingness to try something a little bit different. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure people see an uptick on there on their websites, even if they don't do any changes, but I would condition that that uptick is, is fine. It's going to happen because there's more people looking online. Your other channels are going to dry up a bit though. This wholesale channel of importing a ton of shoes and trying to like fit it in where you can, that that'll be long gone. I think um, mm-hmm. because you have to optimize your cost and your distributions and some of those mom and pops aren't going to be there like they once were. Some of them weren't profitable anyway because they're having to be discounted down so much. You were just basically getting revenue. You weren't making any profit. Um, yep. So these, I mean, some of this is, it's not directed at anybody, but I think we just need to be harsher with ourselves and then be open more. Um, you know, I, I read a really good quote about, uh, I think it was from Dick Johnson, the CEO of Foot Locker. And, mm-hmm. and he was saying like, we always had these digital opportunities, but we were so focused on our brick and mortar, making sure that was really the focus. Now we've had this time to spend on the digital and now we're, we're really seeing opportunities, which really made me excited because even Foot Locker, which is so, I would say they're one of the most forward digital thinking, you know, retailers out there. Um, they're saying they can do even more. Yeah. Which means that if you haven't done anything, what are you doing? I know. I know. Tell me about it. That's when you get kicked in the back. Oh, all right. Jasmine, <laughs> you want to chime in for the last word? I think, I think all your ideas are pretty good. I mean, you normally have pretty good ideas, uh, but no, I'm in agreement of like 90% of everything you said. I, I'm excited to see what companies um, like move forward and really like have a different take on things from having this time that we're having right now. So it'll be interesting. And even seeing the articles that will come out and, you know, post this time and and saying how people have taken it three steps forward. So I'm excited and how it benefits me personally as a a shoe lover. So, well, on the next episode, we will cover the 10% that Jasmine disagrees with Andy. (laughs) on. It'll be much more interesting. (laughs) Oh man. 10%, 10 percent hey that's fine by me man I'm, I, that's hall of fame statistic right there that's all, right. that's all right jordan didn't hit 98 percent of his shots uh, yeah. Yeah. 
All right, folks, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, this has been uh, – these These are some of the things – from an F-38 perspective, we constantly think about this stuff for our members. Yep. I think a lot of us have traditionally seen us as the lobbying side and the government relations, and of course we are. We're out front every single day in the front lines talking to our friends in Congress, talking to our friends in the executive branch from Commerce to USTR to the White House, figuring out things, lobbying for footwear jobs and for footwear people. But we also have a huge business component to our side to where we're constantly talking to members, figuring out where the change is, figuring out where the value is, and helping either form collaborative uh, endeavors to solve industry challenges on the back end, not at the competition on the front end where everybody wants to compete, um, but solving things as a unit and just being thoughtful about where the change is occurring and helping everyone get there, not just – not just the titans of our industry, which which you know are great, but also every single member that we have, big, small, startup, whatever it is, helping them think a little bit differently and get a little bit better. So hopefully this this did that as we kind of this kind of riffed into a pol- pontification of pat on the back or push over the edge. I'm still here, so that's good. Uh, Matt, do you want to take us out? Because I've talked a lot this episode. Yeah, of course. So with that, folks, we are so glad that you've joined us for the Shoe-In Show. It is the Fort Worth Industries podcast. It is your podcast. And by that, we mean that we accept all five-star ratings in iTunes and or, or wherever you find your podcast streaming. So rate us five stars only, please. We reject all stars below five. Beyond that, we ask that you go to our website, shoeinshow.com, where you too can leave a message an audio message on our website via the, the mic link there that we will play on our podcast as long as it enhances the podcast and keeps us at that five-star rating. We should say um, on this episode in particular, please go and use that and tell me if I'm absolutely crazy or if you absolutely agree. Like this should be a real, this should be a real impetus for people to comment and share their ideas for the future of e-commerce in particular. Yeah, so go do that at shoeandshow.com. And beyond that, you can access our catalog of well over 200 episodes from everything from shoe songs, shoe movies, to Cliff Sifford three or four times, to to you name it. We've talked about it. We are your shoe industry podcast. With that, on behalf of Andy Polk, Andy's Polk pontifications, and one Jasmine Pendergrass, who's keeping us straight in all things fashion, this is Matt Priest, and Shoe In Show is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.